welcome. Nice to see you all. Nice to be in Madrid. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, container security. Um, about um, container security. Um, my name is Justin Cormack. I'm the security lead at Docker, um, and I'm based in Cambridge, UK, so not very far away. Um, we're a global company with offices in San Francisco, Paris, London, Cambridge, and various other places across Canada, across the world. Cambridge is a funny little tech village that I live in. It's a small town outside London. Uh, this is near where I live. We have you know, cows and telescopes and things in Cambridge, and lots and lots of tech. Um, it's a fun place to visit if you happen to be in the UK. Um, container security is often a confusing place, and I think that um, it's often hard to get simple answers about security. Um, I mean, partly that's that security is kind of complex sometimes, um, and often it's because security is about risk management often as well, not actually fixing things necessarily. It's, it's an ongoing process of making things better and working out which things you're going to focus on. You know, kind of like like all development, and it's like it's, it's hard to some you know to give answers that just solve all problems. And people's requirements really differ in security as well. Some people, you know, have totally different risk profiles and are doing different things. Um, there's also a really confusing thing that there's all these security vendors and they'll tell you things to make you scared so you buy stuff. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that they necessarily have bad products, but that just is often the way that security is sold. And I think it's really kind of um, a really bad way to sell anything. And I, I would recommend that you kind of think about your real problems that you want to solve, not problems that other people are trying to make you scared about. Um, and sometimes security people can't talk about details of things that happen as well because it's all confidential, which makes it, things difficult sometimes as a security person because you, 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 can't, you can't talk to people about things that, you, that would be helpful for them to understand. Um, it's important to understand that security is a journey and a process. As I said, it's about risk management and improving things. Um, uh, there's a term DevSecOps, which is a building on DevOps. DevOps was you know, the thing that we started 10 years ago now, where developers and operations people started talking to each other and working together for the first time. Well, not necessarily the first time, but it was a, a process to bring them together. And DevSecOps is attempt to do this, bring the security people into this conversation who were often really um, sat very much outside the development team and outside the operations team and kind of were people who just said, no, you can't do that. Um, everyone should be involved in security and understand security. Security is something that you can learn about, something that you can participate in. Sure, you need specialists for some things, but it always helps if people understand the basics and, and um, you can't rely on specialist developers to do everything. Same with security. And everyone's got to be free to ask questions and raise concerns. Often I find that a lot of the important security issues, the first thing to do is ask the people who develop the code, which bit are you worried about? Which bit do you think is a problem? Which bit do you want me to look at first? Um, and because people know that when they wrote the code that they didn't make it as good as it could be or they were just unsure about something or they would just had this nagging doubt in the back of your mind that worries you about some piece of code. And, and it's important to see security as quality. You know, it's, it's an, another aspect of quality, developing quality software. And quality isn't something that a quality team does. It's something that everyone has to do together and everyone has to be professional and, and, and make time to make things better, higher quality and more secure. And you can... You, People have to learn about security, and it's really important to help. You know, if you're if you're managing a team or you're working with a team, just help help them find time to learn more about security. You know, it's a it's a really actually interesting subject. Um, I th people, I think, learn in different ways. Some people like to learn by going to conferences. Some people like to actually try things like capture the flag competitions, where you try and hack something that's been set up for you, so it's you can kind of explore something. Um, some people just like to read, read papers and books, and they, um, some people like to look at the tools that there are available, and some people like kind of formal training courses. I, I, I think you, you know, just 
explore these things with different people and find out what works for the people you work with. Um, think, you, threat modeling is a really interesting subject that not many people know about. It's just trying to understand how to think about which which things are threats in, your, in the way your software is set up, what kind of issues you should be thinking about, what kind of uh, things could go wrong. Um, offensive security and defensive security are very different areas, sort of red team and blue teams, attacking or defending. Um, and all, all that you can learn about how things work inside is really important for security. It's hard to really understand security risks if you don't really deep down understand how your, how your whole stack works. Um, my, my background um, was through um, uh, being an ops person, so I, you know, I, I kind of spent quite a lot of time learning the internals of things like Linux, and that's been really helpful for me as I've learned more, you know, understanding container security, because those kind of internals of things like Linux system calls are the basis out of which a lot of this stuff's built. And so spending time deep diving the bits that you feel or your team feel weak about is really helpful for security because the more you, the more, you can't, it's difficult to understand security without understanding how all the details fit together. And then, like everything else in the sort of in the modern world, repeatability and automation are really, really important. Um, if you haven't got an automated CI/CD pipeline, automating security is going to be really hard. Um, you need, but it's you know it's, it's part of that ongoing process of building automation. It's not. It's not that um, manual security work is not important or anything. It's actually really important to explore and test things on an ad hoc basis. But you want to get the fundamentals actually automated so that you don't kind of regress back to a state of if you've changed something and you've opened up the same security issue as you had before. So like everything else, you want to have tests and automation for your tests and, and run the tests on an ongoing basis in your pipeline to make sure. And we'll talk about that a bit more later. And what's different about cloud native security from kind of you know security as computer security as it's been known for, for for a long time? The main thing is that it's so easy to change things because everything is code. Once upon a time, you know, there was physical firewalls that were wired into the network, and if you wanted to change them, someone had to go into the wiring closet and change the cables around, um, and things things were hardware. Um, now we know that hardware is just software on more computers, um, and everything is being deployed as code. And you can change all the code and all your infrastructure, and everything is just, you know, in a, hopefully in a Git repo, or you're trying to get it to the stage where it's in a Git, re Git repo, where it's automatable and can be redeployed. So um, that's great. You can change things really fast, but it also means that you can really break the security very hard by mistake or, on, or someone could do it maliciously. So you could accidentally remove things that you actually require for security, like um, encryption or firewalls or, or isolation of services or the ability of one service to talk to another and so on. So your configuration for security needs tests, like any other kind of bit of code you have, because anything could break and you want to be able to move fast without breaking things. Security, uh, the difference between security and kind of general code quality, I think, or, we spend most of our time when we're writing code making sure, does my code work? Does it work? You know, can I, can I navigate the actions I need? Can someone buy something from our store? Can you, you know, can, can people do everything where they're supposed to be able to do? Does this feature work? Security, is, that's the happy path about when things work. Security is about what happens when someone does something that's, they're not supposed to do. It's all the other cases that you tend not to test so much. Um, you know, what happens if someone tries to change the price that they're paying for something on the shopping cart? What happens if they, um, you know, try and log in through through a back door? All these things. And that's, there's there's many more things that are not in the happy path than the happy path, unfortunately. So security, security testing is much harder because there's so many things that potentially could go wrong and it's really not necessarily possible to t actually um, test them all, obviously, because there's an infinite number of things that uh, can go wrong and go... So, but we need to, that's why you need to try and prioritise which ones are important. Um, 
also with difference between sort of traditional security is that often we've got less of a separation of concerns. It's more, you know, we have a def, we have DevSecOps, we all work together. Um, that gets rid of the sort of slow things where, you know, you, before you ship something in production, the security team would have to audit it for a few months and check everything was okay and follow the procedures. Often those things kind of get watered down in many environments. Um, but separations of concerns and checks and balances does have some value. Um, and you need to kind of try and replace these with other ways of doing things. I think that code review, for example, is a really excellent way of getting someone else to take a look at something you're doing and say, um, maybe you sh this isn't right. Maybe you should think about this case. Have you thought about this case and, and talk about it? Also, automation and so on. So we need to replace some of some of the things that we're removing with 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 a replacement way of doing checks and balances. This is a diagram that I really like from a Gartner report. If your organisation subscribes to Gartner, you should um, look at it. It's from last year. Um, it shows all the different places marked with the little red arrows where someone could attack your automated deployment process that you might not have thought about. So everything from the developer's laptop, the build, build servers, all the way out to production and so on. So a lot of these things are things that are, that are kind of new to an automated deployment process that people haven't thought about so much. Um, you know, so you've got to keep your image registry, your container image registry secure. Um, you've got to keep your databases secure. You've got to stop people. You've got to have credentials and all these things to stop people modifying the data in them. So there's a lot of there's a lot of new things to think about in security in a, in a modern pipeline. Um, it's important to start with your code because um, there's two things about your code. I guess M much of your code is is often exposed directly to the internet. It's the actual customer facing pieces so it has risks um, itself um, and the things that are directly exposed to the public are often uh, you know kind of a, obviously a high risk thing from the point of view of you know SQL injection attacks credentials um, cross-site scripting all those kinds of things um, also it's very much your own responsibility own your security of your code and you know love your code um, you know just if you're if you're unhappy about your code, spend you know spend more time fixing technical debt and improving your code. You can ask for help. You can buy external audits. They're expensive, but they can be very worthwhile. Um, and you know you can get some get a company to spend a couple of weeks or so pen, pen testing your code, looking at the source code, looking for vulnerabilities. That's really really valuable. It's something that we do internally with our code on a on a regular basis with different pieces of our stack. Um, open source code, if your code is open source, it can get more audit, though it doesn't necessarily. Often code is open source, but actually no one looks at it, so it's not a it's not a necessarily a solution. But if it's a popular piece of code, yet yeah, people will come and look at it. So you might want to think about open sourcing parts or all of your code. Um, before you design security-related features, get a security design review. That's actually what a lot of my job is, is um, doing design, security design reviews on the code that we build internally at Docker. Um, so I, I, get, I look and see what's, what's coming up and, and insert myself into the design process and make sure that, there's a, that I get to see it or someone else in the security department gets to see it and that it gets signed off. And, um, you know, especially if it's something like authentication or, or something where it's obviously security relevant, but also if it's just a, something that's very different from something we've done before and maybe there's some risks that the people haven't thought about. So anything with certificates, encryption, things like that's obvious. But um, as I said before, code review or pair programming was a way of doing code review up front rather than later. That's great too. And you know, think about security issues in review. Like, if you're unsure, you've opened a pull request, tag someone in your security team to take a look. Um, you know, there's, you know, just be open about it. Think about it as you're doing it. There's also automated tooling. Um, most programming languages have some kinds of tools that will find some sorts of issues. Um, they find a lot of obvious issues like SQL injection because that's really easy to find from code scanning. Um, 
Um, but there's other tools, and uh, GitHub's just bought a company similar which does some of these tooling, so some of that might be available on GitHub soon, hopefully. Um, fuzz testing is another kind of new technique that can be helpful for some kinds of things, and there's um, some automated services that'll help you do that as well, so it's worth looking at these things. Um, tooling won't find everything, but it's good to use it when you can. Um, I want to talk a bit about supply chain security as well, because it's something that people that's particularly relevant to cloud native and something that people don't necessarily talk about much or think about much. Um, if someone's going to attack you, um, they can either just try and attack your production environment, or they can just try and insert code into your production environment via your build process or, or through adding a hostile library or something else. So rather than, you know, maybe it's difficult to attack your code because you've hardened it and it's really nice and secure, but uh, if you can just attack your build server, change the code that you're about to ship without you noticing and ship it, then you're already running hostile code in your runtime environment without actually having to hack the runtime environment. It's kind of um, easy and it's kind of a risk that's happening a lot more now because people have started hardening and their runtime and they haven't hardened their supply chain. And we call it supply chain because it's the bits that make up your code, like in the way that um, you know, if you're making a food product, all the, all the ingredients you buy are called the supply chain. Um, and people, you know, people haven't really thought about this much and they haven't maintained their supply chain very safely. There's, a, there's been so many examples of this. I've got a couple here. So uh, NotPetya was an attack uh, last year where a Ukrainian tax accounting software package was, the build servers were compromised um, and it automatically rolled out automated updates to all the companies who use this accounting system that basically looked like ransomware. It basically, it was downloaded onto a machine, it attacked other machines, it looked like ransomware, but actually it just wiped all your machines. Um, it, some companies, uh, had destroyed almost all their Windows infrastructure. Um, huge amounts of damage were caused, hundreds of millions of dollars for some companies. There's a great article that story in Wired, which is really kind of gripping read about it, which I highly recommend if you haven't haven't read it. Um, it was targeted at Ukraine, but uh, but actually just random, uh, sort of, but it affected companies all over the world who happened to be using this. Like maybe their Ukraine office was using this accounting software, and then it attacked across the network to other machines. So it was it, it hit globally. Um, it, you know, this is not the kind of thing you want. Event Stream was a more a recent one where someone took over a library. Library security is becoming something that people are noticing about more after the kind of left pad thing and so on. But a volunteer offers to take over an open source package. Yeah, that's nice, friendly. Uh, but they were actually targeting a specific uh, company and added a malicious backdoor that only affected that company on a single release that that company was using and lots of other people weren't using. It was a very, very specifically targeted attack. Um, you know, you have to sort of worry that dependencies you have could potentially be hostile. So getting the right code to production is really, really important. Um, the, real, the starting point is just hardening your CI system. Um, there's been a lot of security vulnerabilities in Jenkins plugins, which are used very widely, and you need to have a process of updating these as much as, you know, consider them as your production infrastructure. Um, keep your software updates on your CI machines. Um, Long-lived CI machines are more of a risk because to be hacked, just rebuild and reinstall them on an ongoing basis because they're, they, they're ephemeral, they don't need to be long-lived. Um, don't expose them directly to the internet. Try and avoid people actually logging into CI machines. They can run the tests locally, hopefully, and make it, make it easy to run the tests locally, not just in CI. Um, be careful about the credentials that CI machines have. Don't give them too many. Make sure that they don't, you know, if, if, if the CI machine just needs to be able to read your code, make sure it doesn't get write access to GitHub, for example and protect things like S3 buckets and so on that you use to store and uh, registries and all those things you store your code in. Um, once you've got past the basics, there's a couple of um, CNCF projects that are, 
Um, I'm a maintainer of Notary, so I know, I, I know about that, but um, Entoto is a kind of new CNCF project. Um, so they're both around signing where your codes come from and, and where it's going and what it's for. So Entoto is about the process, is about sig digital signatures around the build process and Notary is around digital signatures for updates. They, um, if you're interested, take a look um, and look at the Docker Trust commands in Docker. Um, they require a bit of planning and there's something that you should get to after you've, after you've done the basics. Dependency management, as I said before, supply chain vulnerabilities through dependencies is a real problem. And the answer, you know, it's not reasonable to just read the code of all your dependencies every time you update them. No one has time to do that. It's, you know, it's just not helpful to tell people to do that because, you know, you've got a thousand dependencies and 30 of them updated every day. It's just, that's too much code to read. Um, and it's difficult to know which ones to trust as well. So, I mean, to some extent, you know, try and use kind of official and well-reviewed and popular dependencies. Those are more likely to be uh, trustworthy. Um, um, participate in the maintenance of them yourself. You know, if, if, many of the problems we've come because of things are not maintained at all, or someone's offered to take over because they're not maintained. If you're using open source software, contribute back to it, help maintain it. It's it's a, it's work, but someone's got to do it, and a lot of the problems. Are, Around security, or because people are not doing that, so you know, get involved. Um, and you are best off patching, not not patching, even if you think you've got a working version, because there are more security vulnerabilities that you'll have by not patching than you will by the occasional risk you hear about from actually, you know, where patching was a, a mistake. Almost all the time, the risks are worse from not patching. There's some work on trying to make dependencies safer. So there's a really interesting talk, um, making npm safe, but install safe by Kate Sills, uh, which I highly recommend the video transcript of, um, which is some new features in JavaScript that limit what a module, what an imported program can do. So for example, you can use a library and you can guarantee it doesn't have access to the network, so it can't exfiltrate credentials if it's only supposed to do computation. Um, this works in process, but it's um, I, I think this kind of protection is really exciting in future and I really recommend the talk is really really well done talk so that's supply chain security security in production um, configuration is a really really important thing you we read all these things about open s3 buckets um, even though Amazon has introduced all these alerts and things for public s3 buckets which I'll send you you still read about personal data found on S3 bucket, um, all sorts of things found on S3 buckets. People are obviously not reading Amazon's helpful alerts. Um, configuration is code, it's easy to get it wrong. Again, the best solution is writing tests. Make sure you have security tests. Make sure that you know, your deployment will actually tests, you know, tests reading an S3 bucket with no credentials and see can it read the contents of the bucket. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an easy test to write. And test these things in production because that's, you know, it's all, you can have unit tests and integration tests, you know, run everything in the CI environment, but you, the, the environment you really want to be secure is actually production because that's where the real risks are. So you actually want to be able to run tests in production, that not tests that do something fatal necessarily, but just test your S3 buckets in production, you know, once... Once you know, once an hour, once a week, whatever it is, just you know, test the permissions on your S3 buckets and make sure someone hasn't accidentally deployed something that changed them. Um, um, and for for Kubernetes, we, um, admission controllers can actually test things before they come into production as well, which is kind of is useful. Um, there's a really nice CNCF project called Open Policy Agent, which um, has a really nice. Um, project called Gatekeeper, which is a CNCF admission control, oh, sorry, a Kubernetes admission controller, which you can use. And there's a, a growing community around examples around this. So you can, you can borrow other people's code and adapt it to your use cases. So you can do things like re require specific labels, which, and the labels are going to enforce access control through other tests and so on. It's not a substitute for tests, but it's, it'll stop you. You really want to you really want to make sure that you don't deploy something bad in production, and then also in production you're, you're actually testing that that actually worked as well. So it's a kind of you can 
you can be fairly sure that you didn't ever deploy something broken into production that was insecure, but you also really want to have some of these ongoing tests in production to make sure that there wasn't a bug in your actual admission controller or something didn't manage to bypass it or, or, or something that you hadn't really thought about because you can never be too, too sure about these things. Another thing that's really nice about the whole cloud native security that wasn't really a, something before, we used to have computers that stayed up for years because you know, if you reboot your computer and it used to break. Um, you don't have long running machines in cloud, you don't have to, and hopefully all your infrastructure is in source control and you can rebuild and redeploy it. So try just, um, I mean, we, we kind of introduced this with containers, that containers were designed, you know, it's to be ephemeral, so you could redeploy them as much as possible. So you don't have to keep them running for a long time. And it's the same with whole machines now that we have, you know, all our machines in, in CI, uh, all our machines in, um, in uh, as code as well. So you basically, if someone attacks a machine or a container and they've got some code running in there, if you redeploy it once a day or once a week, then they've got to re-attack it, which is actually difficult for an attacker to do. And you're more likely to notice, because a lot of the notifications you get about suspicious behavior are just going to be alerts for when things change. And if someone's just sitting there running code, then you might not notice that. So it's, it's really great to basically tear down and redeploy all your infrastructure on a regular basis. We have um, our, our more paranoid clients will uh, not keep any machines running for over a week. Um, and not keep any containers running over a, a day or so. I mean, obviously, if you're redeploying new code, you're going to re you're deploying them anyway, but you can just do rebuilds and redeploys regardless on, on an ongoing basis, even if you're not actually deploying code changes. Um, so that's something that cloud native and having, a, having infrastructure as code really gives you that you didn't have before, that gives you a security advantage. Now, container breakout is something that people like to talk about all the time, and it's something that is people's first question. It's not actually the main security issue with containers. It's not something that happens all the time, or in fact, very often at all, if ever. Um, there are ways, I mean, there are things that you can do which will make it higher risk. If you run privileged containers in production, privileged containers are not containers. They, you can escape from them very easily. Um, and that's true of some of the other kind of privileged things, some sort of bind mounts and things like that that you can do. Do not, you know, just mount volumes and so on. Don't run as root if it's all possible. But it gets a lot of news coverage, but it's not a big risk of, of containers. The risks are in your code, your dependencies, your pipeline and things like that. There have been a few issues historically. There were two issues in Run-C, for example, um, over the years. One at the beginning of this year, one a couple of years, three years ago. So that's, you can see the kind of frequency with which these are. These are not issues that have been in the news as company was hacked because of Run-C. These were things that the maintainers fixed and patched before anyone knew about them. Um, and they were mitigated by um, various setups like SE Linux or not running with root and things like that. So they, these were things that, even if they had been attacked, probably wouldn't have affected many people. Um, and these are really difficult attacks to make. There's, there's Netflix is, and some and us and various other people are planning a bug bounty on this. It'll be a very large bug bounty because it's kind of rare, and you know, we, it's something that you can, you want to pay out hundreds of thousands of dollars for because it's just really, really hard to do. Obviously, it's 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 bad if people do, but it's very, very difficult. Um, there. The, the other risk case is um, if you attack the kernel directly from inside a container. Um, again, mostly not running containers as root fixes this. The Docker setcom policy with default fixes this, which is finally going to be introduced to Kubernetes soon, I believe. We we're still working on it. Um, but you can, you can add it yourself. Um, the best thing is just to make sure that your host system's kernels are patched. These, these things get patched you know, and fixed on a regular, a fairly regular basis, and you just need to make sure your hosts are update, your host OS is updated, patch your container runtime, patch Kubernetes. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. There's releases, so make sure that you've just got an ongoing process to be able to patch and, and build things, and um, or run a, or you know, use a managed service that will patch things for you, and so on. You know, just to make sure. 
So kind of wrapping things up, um, you know, understand your risk profile, what are the targets, uh, you know, what, what, are the, what are the things that are high risk, what's, um, where might people attack, you know, obviously things like payments, your, your PCI compliance, if you're taking money and things like that, but um, everyone has their own kind of risk profile, which, is, which are the bits are, that are most, of your infrastructure, the most important for your business, um, and where are the weak points, but don't think about just the weak points, just attacking it directly. Think about indirect attacks like the supply chain. Like, how could someone get code into that weak point? How could they attack that weak point via less direct means than the, you know, the, the first thing is to think of the direct attacks and then to think of the indirect attacks and then the indirect attacks that you have even more indirect attacks and think about the risks like that. And help all the team understand this. It's really important that you know it's not just a something that one or two one person does in your organization or two people do. It's something that everyone thinks about and everyone understands. Because if something does go wrong with security, it's it's going to affect all of you. It's going to you're going to have a, a security instance give you a really really bad day or week or month, and they stop. Um, you know, they fixing them takes time and is really painful, and it stops work on everything else that you really do want to work on and. Um, if you haven't actually, you know, experienced being, you know, involved in a security incident, um, uh, you need to kind of plan for that as well. I think it's um, it's important to to think about, you know, have a process, have a have rehearsals. You know, there are um, you you can do actual red team penetration tests where you don't know that these the people hacking your site are not. Are being, you know, are on contract to you, and just um, it's it's actually fake real if you want, or you can just kind of do dress rehearsals and, and practice when you do know it's fake. Um, it all depends on on what works for your team, but it's you know it's it, it really can be something that totally disrupts your kind of day to day work for a while, and and so you need to try and avoid it as much as possible. Um, if you're interested in some of these CNCF projects, I'm involved in CNCF Security. We're a relatively new cloud native security group. Started a few months ago. We have um, public meetings every Wednesday, um, and a, um, and a really bunch of friendly people. And if you want to learn more about security in the kind of in the cloud native world, it's a good place to start. Um, we all um, we do security assessments of open source projects. We've just done a couple, and we're just doing more. And you can kind of volunteer to, to either help us, or if you're kind of new, just to watch while we do it and see the kinds of things that security professionals look at. So it's um, we've got a real focus on, on on helping people understand processes and then participate in them later, um, and understanding you know the landscape of projects, the kinds of risks people are doing. It's um, it's it's a, it's a it's a very diverse group of people from um, industry and academics and um, government and all sorts of places. So it's 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 good fun. So if you're if you're kind of if you want to learn through that kind of forum, do uh, there's also um, sessions recorded from KubeCon that you or, um, that we've done as well um, that are really interesting. You should go to or listen to it, watch, or come along if you're coming to KubeCon. Um, we have an enterprise platform, as I'd like to mention. As a, we're, you know, I'm not a vendor person trying to scare you. I'm more interested in educating you. But um, we have a platform that provides some help and handholding with security. It, nothing, can, no product will solve your security problems. This is something you have to do. But if you're interested, we do provide that. And I've got time for some questions, or you can always get in touch with me. I'm often on Twitter. You can email me if you want to ask questions privately, or I'm around, obviously, for today and tomorrow, so come and talk to me. Um, I'm friendly, and um, I was, I was <laughs> happy to answer all sorts of questions. So, Anyone got questions they want to ask now? Or, or free, feel free to come and find me. I'll be, I'll be wandering around.